Hello, bonjour, and welcome to 19th Century French Studies in Captivity, a monthly series of conversations about new books in our field. I'm Susan McCready at the University of South Alabama, and I'm so pleased to welcome you along with co-organizers Masha Belenki at George Washington University and Rachel Mesh of Rachel Mesh of Yeshiva University. Our featured speaker today is Colin Foss, who is assistant professor of French at Austin College, which is just north of Dallas. His work on the literature and history of 19th century France has appeared in Dix-Neuf, 19th century French studies, and French Forum. His next book project is going to investigate the connections between 19th, the 19th century renovation of Paris and um, settler colonialism. But today he's going to be talking about his first book, which is just out with Liverpool University Press. It's called The Culture of War, Literature of the Siege, Siege of Paris, 1870 to 1871. Today, Colin will be chatting with Nick White, who is professor of 19th century French literature and culture in the University of Cambridge, where he's also a fellow of Emmanuel College. Uh, Nick has edited and authored 10 book length volumes, including The Family in Crisis and French Divorce Fiction. In recent years, he's published numerous articles on Zola and the literature of 1870, 1871. And he's currently working with Marion Glomou Carbonnier on a two-year project funded by the European Union on the family at war in French culture after 1870, which is gonna bring his two interests together. And now Nick White uh, also has a few introductory remarks before we hear from Colin. So, mesdames, messieurs, Nick White. Uh, many thanks, Susan uh, and Rachel and Marsha for your uh, collective brilliance in putting together this year such a stimulating series of conversations, which we've all really enjoyed. Uh, let me introduce our conversation with Colin by noting that the academic year 2020-2021 is a time of commemoration for those of us who work on 1870-71, in particular on the Franco-Prussian War and the Commune. Events which take us from the war between France and the Germanic states after the Ems telegram in the summer of 1870 to French defeat at Sedan in early September and the fall of the Second Empire. As we'll hear, Colin's book, The Culture of War, which I've enjoyed enormously, focuses on the textual productivity within the city during the Siege of Paris from September the 19th, 1870 to January the 28th, 1871 prior to the civil war of the Paris Commune in spring 1871. Okay, um, in political terms, uh, the siege is bookended by the birth of the French Third Republic in September and the unification of a new German empire in January. Today, Europe is living through a period of turbulence and reconfiguration, Brexit and all that, in which no relationship seems a greater potential source of stability than that between France and Germany. And it has never seemed more vital to hold on to a proper and full understanding of the post-1945 European project with France and Germany at its core as a response to the experiences of the period from 1870 to 1945. Living through a pandemic, we might all feel that one way or another, we understand better than we have ever done what Victor Hugo means when he describes 1870-71 as an année terrible. Indeed, we might be tempted to say that once again, this proverbially forgotten war overshadowed by two later world wars, seems to have been submerged under the events of the current moment. But to say this would be to overlook so much that is happening, not just from historians and museums, but also within the literary and cultural field. In the final pages of his book, Colin compares Maupassant's short story of 1883, Deux Amis, to Albert Camus' La Peste. And in the preceding pages, Colin's exploration of the profusion of cultural productivity during the siege shows us in the most timely of fashions just what is possible in a time of confinement. Uh, it has been an absolute pleasure over the past few years to hear Colin at our Home From Home, the annual NCFS colloquium, of course, but also at our 19th century seminar in Cambridge, speak about the siege. Now from the faculty at Austin College, but first as a graduate student at Yale. And there is a kind of, um, chiasmic pleasure for us in talking in the wake of a series of such wonderful conversations which began back in August with Maurice Samuels and Andrew Counter. My own way into 1870-71 has been via later representations of the war, in particular Zola's La Débâcle, and Colin's work continues 
continually pushes me to rethink a specific cultural context, which Zola in some sense avoids. Though reference, the siege is to some extent backgrounded in Zola's novel. Zola's retrospection, La Débâcle, was the object of a journée d'études organized in November by Eleonore Reversi from Paris 3. Colin, though, is going to take us into the heart of 1870-71 itself and the cultural textual objects which the siege of Paris produced. And once you've heard Colin speak, I'm sure you'll be keen to follow the link you may have just seen on H France to another event on Tuesday, February the 15th, organized by Eleonore Reversi and Mathieu Roger Lacan from the EHESS, another journée d'études, this time on the siege itself, titled Tableau de Siège, where speakers will include my uh, Cambridge colleague, Marion Glumont-Carbonnier, and Hollis Clayson, who, as we shall hear, has provided a model for Colin's own project on the siege from the realm of visual culture. Many of us in the 19th century community are fortunate to be contributing to a very special, special number on the Paris Commune, edited by Seth Whidden and Rob Sinclair, which is forthcoming from the journal 19th Century French Studies, and includes Colin's own piece on the politics of performance. So there is a lot going on in our field at the moment, even under these siege conditions. And it's in this context that I now invite Colin to talk about his book. Thank you so much. Um, I'm starting my my PowerPoint screen here. Does everything look good for y'all? Yes. Yes, okay, great. Um, all right, thank you all so much for coming. It really is an honor to be with you today as it has been through all of these amazing talks throughout NCFS and Captivity this year. Um, thanks, I'm gonna echo Nick here. Thanks in particular to the organizers, Rachel, Masha, and Susan. Um, and thanks to Nick White for agreeing to be in conversation and for that really great contextualizing, very maybe too generous, um, uh, comments that he made uh, introducing me. Um, and indeed, this is, you know, the 150th uh, year since the 1870-1871. Uh, um, this was not intentional, this book coming out during this period, especially during COVID, I did not intend this, um, but I think it's a happy coincidence. Um, so thank you all. Uh, so uh, the book came out, yeah, last October, so October 2020 with Liverpool University Press, uh, where you can find it if you live in most parts of the world. Uh, in North America, however, the book is distributed through Oxford University Press. Um, and so you'll have to go there if you live in my neck of the woods. Um, I also come bearing discounts. Um, so for North America, uh, you can get a 30% discount uh, of the book at Oxford University Press uh, using the uh, code ADISTA5, ADISTA5. Uh, for the rest of the world, use the Liverpool University Press website for also 30% off using the code LUP30. Um, I'm told these codes do not expire. So for those of you watching on YouTube uh, three years from now, give it a shot. We'll see what happens. Um, these are they, the books. The book is uh, priced for libraries. And so I apologize in advance. Um, so I wanted to begin talking about how this project began. And I know uh, this, you know, it was a dissertation project uh, at Yale French, as, as Nick mentioned. Um, and then, you know, I turned this into a book after I got, uh, after I graduated. Uh, and I know that there's some graduate students in the room and maybe some undergraduates. And so I thought it'd be interesting to talk about how this began. And so as Nick mentioned too, it, you know, when I was in graduate school around 2013, uh, I read a fabulous book by Hollis Clayson uh, uh, called Paris in Despair. Art in Everyday Life Under Siege. Uh, Paris and Despair was a real revelation for me uh, in terms of its methodology uh, and its subject, namely the art of the siege of Paris at the end of the Franco-Prussian War. But in general, the broader period of 1870-1871 was also fascinating to me, um, mostly because it was so complicated. Uh, I think that in grad school, I was looking for puzzles to solve for my dissertation. And I think maybe in, in a lot of our research, we look for puzzles. And 1870-1871 satisfied that desire. Um, a lot of really important things happened during this, this terrible year, this, uh, the année terrible, as, as Nick said, of 1870-1871. Um, so the Franco-Prussian War began, of course, uh, then Napoleon III and his Second Empire fell. Uh, the Third Republic began during this four-month-long siege of Paris at the end of this war. And so, you know, a new government sort of continued the war that Napoleon III began. Um, it was a point where, you know, uh, officials were unelected. Uh, this was, in many ways, government was still up for grabs. Uh, one could call this a revolutionary moment without a revolution. Um, and of course, this is happening in Paris during a siege, a complete blockade of the city. 
And then of course, after the armistice, and maybe this is the part of the story that people know best, uh, the commune, the Paris commune uh, in 1871, which was a real revolutionary moment, but also a sort of second siege uh, in which Versailles troops uh, besieged and then massacred thousands of Parisians simply for having been in the insurrectional uh, capital. It is a tragic and a really confusing period, I think, for us and for those who lived through it. Um, and again, I evoke the idea of the terrible year, as, as Hugo called it, which we can interpret, you know, in many different ways. But I want to get back to the siege. So uh, I thought in graduate school, I was thinking that literature might help us explain some of this complexity, and in, in particular, render it more human. Maybe it could allow us to see how this period was experienced by those who lived through it. Maybe by reading, I thought, broadly, uh, about everything that was published or performed during this period, during the siege, we might be able to get a better sense of how literature created meaning in people's lives. I thought literature might be able to speak on behalf of the besieged. So, and, and Nick mentioned this, you know, we all know some of these later representations, Zola's La Debacle, Maupassant's short stories, uh, Les Soirées de Medan, this naturalist kind of manifesto uh, uh, written by Zola et al. Uh, were also all representations of the Franco-Prussian War and the Siege, and of course, Victor Hugo's book of poetry, L'année Terrible. But as I said, these are all later representations of the Siege. They happened after the Siege. Uh, they happened in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. Uh, what really interested me uh, and interests me in this book were the conditions of the Siege itself. Paris isolated, Parisians left to their own devices just after the Second Empire fell. And the siege, I, I need to note, was a complete blockade. It was nearly impossible to uh, enter or leave the city for four months, um, except famously by hot air balloons. Um, and I think about here about Patrick D. Oliveira's work um, on, on balloon travel in 19th century. But by and large, Paris, uh, which at this point, if you believe David Harvey represented the capital of modernity, was effectively separated from the outside world. So, I started looking for texts that were published strictly during the period of military occupation, or excuse me, military blockade. So from September 1870 to January 1871. And to my surprise, there was an enormous amount of material there. And it was all super fascinating, but not in the way that I expected it to be. And so more on that in a second. So to take a step back from the project's origins, uh, I wanted to ask why this literature has been so forgotten. Aside from Hollis Clayson's book and a couple of articles, you know, such as Rebecca Spang's uh, And They Ate the Zoo, uh, which you may know, uh, most accounts of the siege either ignore literature or explicitly claim that literature was not produced during this period. And yeah, I, a lot of the material I found isn't strictly speaking literary. The texts I found were written by unknown or anonymous authors. We're talking about pamphlets, short political treatises, uh, poetry written by National Guard members, correspondence, diaries, songs, etc. Some of it, I admit, is interesting as literature per se, but most of it needs to be contextualized in order to be appreciated. This is not literature that was intended to speak to the human condition in general, uh, but to condition the conditions of besieged Parisians in the winter of 1870-1871. And while a lot of it is self-referential to a fault, a lot of it is very, very fun to read. And so I wanted to give you a few examples of things that were published during the siege. So on the top left here, we see a, a play, Le Forgeron de Chateaudin, uh, which was about the Prussian invasion of France. Uh, it was written and performed during the siege. Um, you can see here, this is an edition from 1871, so published after the events of uh, the siege and the commune, uh, with a preface by the author's father, which is just adorable. Um, below that, you can see uh, La Femme Bonaparte, Ses Amants, Ses Orgies, uh, this is a, a, a siege time publication of, but it's a reincarnation of an 18th century genre uh, called the Libelle. Uh, these are salacious texts that were written about the, the ruling classes. Uh, this one from 1870, La Femme Bonaparte, uh, is about the imagined sex life of the Empress Eugenie. Um, I also want to note the author's uh, pseudonym here, Le Citoyen Vandex. Uh, we have in the middle, uh, Un mois dans les lignes prussiennes. Uh, which is an adventurous account of tendin, tending to wounded soldiers written by a surgeon, a chirurgien. Uh, and then finally on the right here, uh, an anonymous journal d'une parisienne uh, published by the uh, Journal des Demoiselles before the siege even ended. Uh, so this was published in the newspaper uh, Journal des Demoiselles and then republished as a standalone text by their printing press. So even if these 
even if these books in particular, but books in general during the siege weren't instant classics and they may never become classics at, at all, they were very popular at the time. It's the type of literature that appeared in newspapers that was performed on the stages of boulevard theaters, sometimes as interludes uh, or written sur le vif uh, in the moment, uh, published and read just as quickly next to the kiosk where it was published or where it was purchased, excuse me. Uh, this was ephemeral literature. It only makes sense within, the con within its specific historical context. At the time they called them pièces de circonstance, uh, texts that arose from a, a specific historical situation. So I think if we, if we expand our understanding of literature to include these ephemeral texts, these, these pièces de circonstance, the siege was a moment of intense textual literary production. So to make this argument very quickly, um, I point, for example, to the nearly 130 new newspapers that appeared during these, these four months. Uh, and this is in addition to the, the, the major dailies that had already been in uh, publication before that. Or I could point to the hundreds of diaries that were written during the siege, many of which were uh, appeared in print during a diary publishing bubble in the uh, 1870s. I might also point to the sold out shows of boulevard theaters and at places like the Comédie Française in the later days of the blockade. As one editor put it during the siege, quote, the sound of cannons could not extinguish the voices of our authors. I might finally point uh, to the first French publication of Victor Hugo's book of poetry, Les Châtiments. Les Châtiments was by far the bestseller of the siege, uh, which makes sense, I think. Uh, Victor Hugo wrote it while in exile during the Second Empire as an attack on Napoleon III, uh, but once the emperor fell to the Prussians, Hugo returned home and Les Châtiments was published legally for the first time in France. He got to Paris just in time for the siege, uh, during which Parisians welcomed him home by buying as many copies of Les Châtiments as possible. And so a little anecdote here, uh, Hugo's printer, Clay, uh, ran out of coal to fuel his presses. Uh, but only after having sold over tw uh, 20,000 copies over a three month period. So that's about 240 copies per day that were being sold just in Paris of Les Châtiments. So I think in one sense, the success of literature during the siege is not that surprising. This was of course Paris at the end of the 19th century uh, where the industry of literature was massive and lucrative. This was big business. Every year the production of literature reached unprecedented levels. If Parisians were already primed to use literature as a way of understanding their present, then it's not really that unusual that a moment of heightened literary, or excuse me, a, height, a moment of heightened historical awareness would correspond with heightened literary production. But I found two things that were really surprising about this literature. First, it was not famous authors or even famous publishers that were behind many of the new growth areas in literary production. Again, as I said earlier, many authors were unknown or anonymous. Many published texts without, uh, uh, excuse me, many published texts uh, printed without the mediation of an editeur or a publisher, uh, what we might understand now is like self-publishing. The modern industries of literature, which made Paris such a center of culture, were not the primary drivers of new textual production during the siege. So the second surprising thing that I found was that Paris was completely isolated from the world. Due to the Prussian blockade, it was impossible to rely on the global networks of printers, transportation, paper, readership, and coal uh, that made Paris a capital of literature. So the modernity of Paris was less useful, less present during the siege. Uh, modernity seemed like a thing of the past. So I think to explain literary production, as I do in the book, we need to think about the limits of modernity and what exists outside of literary institutions and of literary industries. This is the methodology I employ in the book uh, in which I read texts as embedded within these specific industries that allowed for their production and how those industries can be sidestepped. This is an institutional history of literature, but it's also an anti-institutional history. So to this end, I organized the book into four sections. Um, and so I put them up on the slide here. Um, theaters, newspapers, correspondence, diaries, and then publishing. Um, these correspond to clusters of genres and of media, uh, but they also represent different institutions and different institutional configurations with their own ideologies and their own economic constraints. So I think for theaters, newspapers, publishing houses, it's relatively straightforward how one might understand these as industries with their discontents. So we can think about with theaters, La Comédie Française versus Boulevard Theaters, 
Uh, for newspapers, we can think about major dailies like Le, Constitu Le Constitutionnel or Le Figaro, uh, with new publications such as uh, Le Père du Chien or La Cave, uh, which was one that appeared during the siege, uh, offering delivery to basements in case of bombardment, um, which was a joke, um, but I guess not really. Um, and then, you know, for the publishing industry, we can think about, you know, major publishers like Etzel or Charpentier uh, versus, you know, people with a printing press in their backyard. Um, but I want to end my remarks today uh, with a, an example of correspondence uh, during the siege, where I think it's a little bit more complicated to see how institutional analysis might work. And so I give you here uh, on the slide, um, this is a, a manuscript uh, diary, a series of letters uh, from Caroline Chomoreau. Um, this is a manuscript from the Bibliothèque Historique de la Ville de Paris. Uh, Chamorreau was 22 years old when the siege began. Uh, she was newly married and excited to create a modest life for herself, as she described it. Uh, she wrote, during the siege, she wrote dozens of letters to a friend named Blanche, um, but since she couldn't send them to her because of the blockade, she bundled the letters together and gave them a sort of preface, uh, which I reproduce here on this slide, and I will read for you. Ceci a été écrit pour un ami du cœur, une seconde moi-même. S'il tombait sous la main d'un étranger, je le prierais de ne pas le lire. Il n'y trouverait pas un récit poétique, suivi, enchaîné dans un style pur et élégant. C'est l'épanchement d'un cœur animé de patriotisme, d'un patriotisme peut-être aveugle, et troublé par les angoisses d'un silence de mort sur le compte de sa famille et de ses amis. Ceci a été écrit pour tromper les longues heures des soirées du siège, alors que Paris enserré dans les cercles de fer de l'Allemagne victorieuse, Lutter pour relever son honneur, traîner dans la boue à Sedan, et étonner le monde par l'activité guerrière de ses citoyens, habitués au plaisir et à l'oisivité. So, Chomoreau wrote this preface for strangers in 1871, but I think she also wrote this for us, readers of today, to ask us not to satisfy our curiosity and to leave these letters alone. However, I think her appeal whets our appetite more than it discourages us. She first asks us to abstain from reading these letters and she apologizes for their lack of elegance. Uh, and indeed, you can see that there's a, a spelling mistake that she makes in this. She seems to be saying that other histories of the siege, you know, more professional, more institutional histories might be more readable than hers. But then she reveals that her correspondence contains an emotional and fascinating account of a troubled heart in troubled times. The letters she promises tell the story of a young woman who felt betrayed by France's government and found triumph in the heroism of Parisians faced with isolation from friends and family. In her preface, uh, Chomoreau ultimately convinces us that this is perhaps the most honest, the most adventurous, and the truest history of the siege that we could find. And I think here it's her anonymity that gives her the authority to tell this, this real story. And so I don't want to go on for too long here, so I, I think I'm going to stop here. I hope we have some interesting points of departure for a, a, long, a larger conversation. Um, and thank you, Colin, very much indeed. Uh, uh, it's um, great to hear your your version uh, uh, of events and uh, your account of the the origins of the of the project and uh, all sorts of interesting ideas there uh, that I'm sure we can uh, uh, talk about to do with the limits of modernity, uh, for example. Um, but I, I wondered um, if I could uh, begin by just um, uh, asking you a few questions which the book raised for me um, uh, and perhaps inviting you to respond to um, uh, some of the quotations from the book which really uh, struck me not least so that our audience has a chance to hear your words rather than uh, mine um, and and first of all I wonder if I could ask you a little bit about about that structure of the book that you just uh, introduced um, uh, and you, you talk about structuring the book according to sites of production theatres, newspapers, personal writing and publishing houses, because it indicates how the altered geography of the city created new centres of culture. And I wonder if you could just tell us a bit more about what you mean by that idea of altered geography, the altered geography of the city, um, perhaps with reference to publishing practices. Um, I wonder if you could say a bit more about that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I think that um, one of the major speaking of geography of the city, one of the things that sort of jumps out to one reading these texts published during the siege is that the city didn't change in any sort of physical way, right? I mean, besides bombardment, which happened near the end of the siege, 
um, which was sporadic you know, and, and devastating, but many people died during this bombardment. Um, but the, the city itself really did not change, but I think that it was the, the condition, the sort of psychological conditions of people living through it did change. And so I think uh, Gautier has a quote that um, a lot of people point to, uh, you know, thinking about the city as being encircled by a sort of belt. And even if you weren't planning on leaving Paris, the idea that you couldn't leave did change the way that you interacted with the city. Um, and so I think about, you know, I, I call them sites of literary production because I do believe that they exist in different parts of the city. So if we think about, you know, theaters, I think is the most obvious one. These are brick and mortar structures in which, you know, you have to go there to see, you know, whatever they're, they're performing. Uh, but the way that newspapers were consumed, for example, did change during the siege. Um, and so uh, Edmond de Goncourt notes that, um, you know, in the past, if people had, at, on their way home, they would buy, they would purchase one newspaper. During the siege, they would purchase two or three. Uh, they would read them next to the kiosks uh, to sort of get the news from outside of Paris. And so I think that, you know, the newspaper is being, you know, of course they had offices, but these, this was a literature that was primarily consumed in the street and the siege did not necessarily change that. Um, but I think that the idea that Paris was isolated from the world did make newspapers a different document than it was before. Um, so if newspapers have always, Parisian newspapers have always been concerned about Paris itself, here all of a sudden people were looking for not changes within Paris itself, but sort of what was happening outside. Um, I'm also, you know, you mentioned publishing practices uh, here. A lot of the major publishers, uh, since they were so large, had their printers were either outside of Paris um, or they were within Paris, but they relied on uh, materials like coal, for example, for coming from outside to, to, to fuel them. And so in fact, what made publishing so uh, such a large business in the 19th century, uh, you know, meaning that they could have separate sites to publish or to, excuse me, to print their materials. This in fact was a disadvantage during the siege because they weren't able to use, the, to rely on those networks. And so we do find people dusting off, uh, you know, smaller print, uh, smaller uh, printing machines uh, that hadn't been in use for many years or that had been sort of in private use. And we see a lot of, uh, you know, if we look at the Depot Legal at the, the Archive National, which is sort of the can represent sort of all the published books uh, in Paris during a certain period, and they continued to, to log them during the, um, the siege. If we look at them, a lot of the printers are not listed. Whereas if you look for the years before, you'll always see like a, a name for the printer. Whereas during the siege, sometimes it's without a printer. Some, and of course, the, the authors are anonymous. And so you can see in, in a way, I, you know, I describe this as being literature sort of coming from Paris itself where it's not clear the institutional structures that allowed for a lot of this, this literature to, to appear. And I think, you know, I also think about in correspondence and diaries, um, there was one anonymous uh, diarist who wrote, uh, it was on Christmas Eve, uh, that he could see outside of his window, all of these lights on in other apartments. And he thought about what all these people are doing, you know, isolated from their friends and family during a siege. And I'm thinking about the fact that, you know, they're also probably writing their own diaries in their own homes. And so I think, you know, and I, I think COVID is maybe making me think this too, but I, I'm imagining that the home has become a much larger space for cultural production during the siege as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, it's really interesting all the things you say in the book about the demodernization of publishing practices and the, the fate of the editor during this period and uh, makes us maybe kind of, um, revisit Christine Haynes's work. Uh, in this regard, absolutely. Uh, and, um, uh, and I wonder if I could just ask you about the the critical fate of that literature uh, of produced during the siege, um, which, as you uh, explain, has long been simply or pretty much absent from scholarship on the period. And I just wanted to ask you the the disarmingly straightforward question: Why? You know, what what why why exactly? How how, how would you explain that? Well, yeah, I, I so I think that I'm going to be blunt if, if, with a blunt question. I'll give a blunt answer. A lot of this literature is not good. Like I would not assign this literature for an undergraduate course unless we had another uh, uh, sort of truth that we were trying to get to. Um, and I think that, you know, if we look at Les Châtiments, which is definitely the most well-known, of course, this is the first time it's published in France. Um, this is the most well-known literature that appeared in France during the siege. Uh, but I think even Les Châtiments, you need extensive footnotes to be able to understand what he's talking about in this poem or in these in this poetry. And so it's it's sort of references that one might understand or that one would understand in during the Second Empire and during the siege. Um, 
but it still, it requires a gloss to understand it. And so I think a lot of this literature was so self-referential, you know, referencing the siege, referencing other publications that happened, um, that it requires so much more explanation for it to, to be understood. And so I think that when you're reading these, just kind of, when you just sort of find them, you know, like the literature that was produced, uh, they, they don't speak as, you know, as I said, kind of instant classics. Le Fourgeron de Chateaudin, for example, which is something that I, that, you know, the, the play that I mentioned earlier, um, it's really interesting for the way that it imagines, uh, for the way that we can think about Parisians watching this play, thinking about the suffering of other folks in France during the Prussian invasion, but the play itself is just, it's not that good. I mean, it's, it's kind of, it's overwrought, it's, it's way too, it's melodramatic. Um, and so I think for this reason, looking at the literature, there haven't been, you know, La Debacle was not written and was not written during the siege itself. In fact, Zola wasn't even there. And so if you look at the, the literature that was produced intramuros during the siege, um, it doesn't strike one as being literature at first blush. But I think that if we expand our understanding of this, it, you know, uh, which I think we should, and of course we, we all study popular texts, we study ephemeral texts, and this is something that, um, that 19th century French history, or French literary studies has done for a long time. Absolutely. Thanks, Colin. And that, that uh, brings us on nicely to um, a couple of questions that I wanted to ask about uh, method, your method, uh, ways of approaching uh, literature, however that's defined, as you, as you say. Um, uh, and uh, I wanted to, if I could ask you about what looks to me in your book, almost like a kind of um, anthropology of literature in a sense, uh, because you talk at uh, several points about um, a kind of thick description that you want to produce in the book. Um, and um, uh, you reference John Merriman's work on the commune in that regard, I think. Um, but of course, it, it made me think of uh, Clifford Gertz and so on. Um, and I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about the, the choices, uh, that the implications of the choices that that bid for thick description generates. So um, you say how um, while paying some attention to chronology with the siege, within the siege itself, uh, your book primarily treats the literature of the siege as a coherent whole, sacrificing causality for thick description of what, how and why certain types of texts sprang from this moment. Mm. Uh, so I wonder if you could tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, that so it's, um, a, a very vulnerable spot for me, I think, because I realized that when I was, at, when I, this was a dissertation and when I turned into a book, that doing a micro history, thick description of the siege of Paris, you know, as you mentioned earlier, that this at the end of this forgotten war, um, the Franco-Prussian war, you know, would anyone publish this? Um, <laughs> and so I'll be blunt in my answer here too. Um, but I, I realized that I think that using thick description or micro history might be the wrong way of, of thinking about this. And I know I, I wrote this, but I think I've, I've since, since I wrote it, uh, thought new ways about this, uh, this type of methodology. I think I would describe it more as, as thinking about literature as embedded within certain economic structures within a, a certain historical moment. And of course, I, all texts can benefit from this. It doesn't have to be sort of uh, things like Les Châtiments or Le Fourgeron de Châteaudan or these diaries uh, to benefit from this kind of embedded analysis. Um, but I, you know, I, I think that using this as maybe a case study for understanding uh, how literature gets produced during these heightened moments of historical awareness uh, and so I, I think that this kind of analysis, this kind of methodology would work very well for, you know, um, for example, like the occupation uh, during World War II, uh, other moments of national crisis during the 19th century or perhaps during revolutionary periods. Um, I think that, uh, you know, thinking about the anthropology of literature, the sociology of literature, I'm very indebted to uh, Giselle Sapiro, uh, La Guerre des Écrivains, yeah, who uh, looks at sort of the institutional logics uh, that allowed for literature to get produced during the occupation during World War II. Um, and I think that, you know, this kind of, this approach allows us to see literature more fully. And so I'm worried that um, this is maybe a historian's project, this book. Um, but in fact, I think that use, you know, employing historical strategies, employ, employing historical methodology, um, this can only make text richer. Um, and to think about text as not being this kind of eternal 
there's one version of it. Everyone reads the same version. Of course, this is a, this is a myth that we all know this, um, but to see like when it gets actualized for the first time, meaning when it, when it gets published for the first time, what were the conditions that allowed for its publication? And each other time that it gets actualized, uh, we also need to take into account uh, what made that happen? How did it get reactualized? And in many ways, I think that this is a methodology taken from theater studies as well, right? That every performance of a play is a new iteration and sort of new work, uh, like a, a, yeah, a new actualization of that, uh, of that work. Right, yeah. Um, so you, you, you moved on from anthropology to sociology, um, uh, which is uh, really interesting. And, and, and you talk about literature just not taking place in a void and, th and that, comes across uh, really, really powerfully in the book. Um, uh, anthropology, um, sociology, I wonder if we could ask you a little bit about the politics uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the project. Um, we've got a question here from Jan Matlock, who says, um, isn't it also really significant that censorship of both the press and books has ended with the establishment of a republic? Mm. That's really interesting, yeah. Well, so I think that some of the, um, and, and Jan, let me know if I'm, I'm not responding directly to this question. I think that a lot of the freedoms of the siege uh, came not from a deliberate policy. Uh, this was not the new provisional French Republic that said, uh, you know, we're gonna allow any kinds of publications to happen however you want. So, I mean, for example, the, the, the uh, these new newspapers that appeared, these 130 new newspapers, it was because there was no censorship bureau to police this kind of writing. They just didn't have the manpower, they didn't have the staff, uh, they weren't able to do it. And so I, I think a lot of these, these liberties that appeared during the siege, uh, which really kind of were regressed uh, after the siege, and this is maybe a part of the history of the commune. So censorship being kind of put back in place during the, the beginning of the Third Republic in the 1870s, um, which we really only see kind of uh, opening up again uh, later in the century. Um, I think a lot of this is because of political realities or sort of material realities. They didn't have the folks to, to censor things and so they, they just couldn't. Um, and so I, I think that, I, I think it's, it's interesting to think about censorship during the siege, especially because what I've noticed is that it wasn't the government doing the censoring. It was often internecine sort of, it was these battles between different institutions that allowed for censorship to happen. And so we see people doing self-censorship or censorship of other institutions. So let, let me give you an example of this. A lot of the major daily newspapers that were, existed during the second empire and especially towards the end when censorship was a little bit uh, more relaxed, um, they would sort of actively uh, attack new publications during the siege. And especially the more radical, radical Republican newspapers that appeared during this moment. I'm thinking about like La, La Patrie en Danger, um, for example. Um, and the reason that they would attack them is because, not because the government was telling them, you know, you need to sort of suppress these other newspapers that are coming out, because they profited so well during the Second Republic, the Second Empire, excuse me, um, that any sort of uh, return to a republic or any sort of continuation of the republic would threaten their financial viability. Since they, they profited so well under the Second Empire, they wanted to see a status quo be reinstored. And I have to insist really here during the siege, it was not clear to folks in Paris if Napoleon was gonna come back and the second empire would just continue and it would be a third empire or something. Um, they weren't sure if a monarchy would be reinstalled. They weren't sure if the Republic was there to, to stay. And so a lot of these um, institutions, including major daily newspapers like Comédie Française, um, uh, major publishers, political stability for them meant financial stability. And so I think that the censorship kind of came from below rather than from, from up top. Right, yeah. Uh, and I wonder if uh, uh, we could think uh, now about the, um, the other end of the siege um, and uh, talk a bit about that connection to the commune, uh, which uh, I guess um, uh, must um, stand over the shoulder of any book project on, on the siege. Uh, and, and obviously there's so much uh, at stake in one's uh, uh, investment or otherwise in the commune in writing about the siege uh, and uh, I just wanted to get uh, your your thoughts about that because um, you, you you make some uh, really interesting uh, statements about that in in the book Colin uh, and you you say how uh, the book attempts um, and I think it succeeds uh, 
to cut through ambiguity in a way that allows the siege and by extension the commune to be allowed to speak for itself rather than, than to share the same memorial space. Uh, and then you go on to say how uh, historians and scholars still often read the siege in the light of the commune, um, uh, which has certainly been very fruitful for our understanding, but um, privileges the commune over the siege, uh, during which, of course, the future was uncertain and revolution not yet tangible. Mm. So there's so much at stake, I think, in... Um, uh, in the way in which you you rethink the siege uh, and, and and thereby you know rethink its relationship to the commune, can you say a bit more about about your approach in that regard? Yeah, you know, I, I think that this kind of speaks to the complexity of this period as well. Because I remember in in grad school and even as, when I was writing this book, when I tell people I'm working on the siege of Paris, they would often say they would often just start talking about the commune, and sort of you know I think these these two events get very uh, mixed as I you know as as you quote here in in our in memorial space. Mm -hmm. 1870s, 1880s, 1880s. And there's a really good reason for why. Um, but I do want to sort of distinguish between two of them, um, just as an example here about how they get sort of mingled in the same space. Um, there was a lot of publications in the 1870s that would talk about les deux sièges de Paris, right? That they would talk about the siege of Paris and the commune as being just kind of two, two different sieges that happened, which of course elides, and this is a way of uh, avoiding censorship, in the 1870s and 1880s. So talking about the commune just as being a second siege allowed people to ignore the revolutionary aspects of it and still talk about this, this moment of uh, the commune in particular. But calling in les, les deux sièges or kind of combining them together uh, does uh, ignore the fact that during the siege itself, and this may be a very basic point to make, that the future was uncertain, that folks didn't know if Napoleon, would re Napoleon III would return, if a monarchy would get installed or uh, instated afterwards, or if the republic would continue. And there was, you know, in many ways, this was a revolutionary, the siege was a revolutionary period without a revolution. Nothing finally coalesced around, you know, one idea. The republic was there, but it was kind of lackluster. Um, folks didn't think it was going to last or, you know, um, these were unelected officials, this kind of thing. Um, and so I think that, you know, letting the siege be for itself does allow for the commune to be uh, more fully realized as a revolutionary event. Um, and putting the siege, and of course, you know, putting the siege in the light of the commune makes sense. I, I, there's nothing wrong with doing that because indeed there were moments during the siege in which a commune seemed possible. There were appeals for a commune during the siege of Paris. I'm thinking, for example, about the uh, October 31st, uh, 1870, um, uh, Parisians stormed the Hôtel de Ville, uh, the, the seat of municipal power in the city, uh, and declared a commune. And for a few hours, at least, uh, they believed that a commune would take place, uh, that the, the, there would be a revolution in Paris. Um, this was squashed, of course, and then you know uh, the, the commune had to happen later. Um, but so I think that giving them their own spaces kind of lets this period speak uh, more eloquently to its own complexities. And I, you know, when I was writing this, of course, I, I couldn't, I didn't have this in mind. But I've been thinking about, uh, you know, seeing on Twitter there have been like memes about, uh, you know, in a hundred years, historians will ask, "Are you studying, um, you know, March 2020 or April 2020?" For your dissertation and it's just i think that we are living right now through also a period in which time seems to be slowed down which every month seems to have its own kind of its own stakes its own uh, potential consequences and when we're in these moments we don't know what the end is going to be and it really does feel like time is sort of is, is stretching out and so i wanted to get that sense of uh, that experience of historical time and of living in that historical experience through a description of the siege itself that's really interesting, and it ties in with a comment that Jennifer Forrest has to make uh, about um, your comment that people read more newspapers than normal. Uh, and uh, Jenny talks about parallels with the three months in the US beginning with the election on November the 3rd and, you know, becoming obsessed with the news, um, um, a heightened sense of time during this um, volatile historical moment. So um, uh, it's really interesting that... Um, that, that comparison. But you know, um, yeah, go on, Colin. You know, it's, it's funny, uh, this, thank you, Jennifer, for this too. It's funny because there was a lot of like misinformation that was being published during the siege itself. Um, and so I'm thinking, for example, um, uh, I can't remember which newspaper it was that declared a victory in Sedan 
uh, the day after, and this is of course a little bit before the siege, uh, they declared a victory in Sedan uh, and then sort of never retracted that, that information. And of course, Sedan was the, the, the battle in which Napoleon III fell. It was definitely not a French victory. Um, and so I, there was, in, in, given the, the, the difficulty during the siege itself to, to get reliable information, folks would grasp onto any kind of information that they could possibly get and then build that into a, a sort of a fable or a legend about a certain event. And I'm thinking about, uh, uh, I, I talked quite a bit about the Battle of Reichshofen uh, during the right. siege, which, yeah, um, uh, which, you know, kind of became this legendary moment uh, in French history, but just for Parisians during the siege itself because they had bad information about what happened during that, that battle. Right, yeah. Uh, and and uh, uh, your comments on the commune uh, connect to um, a, a couple of questions that have come in on, on the chat. Um, Damien Katani um, asks, uh, to what extent did writers such as Chumeroux go on to support the commune between March and May 1871? when there was um, an explosion of anti-canonical, anti-establishment culture, e.g. Courbet and other painters who were against the traditional institutionalized salon. And then, um, uh, yes, uh, um, yes, Benedict, uh, Monica Benedict, uh, a co companion question to Damien's, how about conservative authors such as Fleuriot's quote unquote transition from the siege to the commune and their related literary activities. You know, yeah, that's it's really interesting because I, I think that one of the, the the faults of, or one of the difficulties, let's say, of uh, reading the literature of the siege is that a lot of the texts that are available to us are written by bourgeois well-off authors, right? Bourgeois well-off Parisians. Um, and this is, of course, also is a part of an institutional history, right? And I try, I try to get at other histories of this and other voices, um, but the majority of what we have are, you know, folks that are more or less conservative. And so therefore, you know, and I'm thinking about Paul Lidsky's Les, Les Écrivains contre la Commune, right? And so but we don't really have that many kind of uh, authors during the siege itself or during this period that were pro-commune. Uh, I mean, there are, but it's sort of uh, the, the vast majority of people were, were conservative in the way that they approach this. Um, and so we, the Chomoreau in particular, I, I think that I want to point to her as being maybe not representative, but just interesting, is that she begins, uh, really, she led the kind of life that the Second Empire smiled upon, that Napoleon III smiled upon. Uh, she was sort of upper middle class, like she'd done some genre painting, you know, like she had, like, she was a kind of a literary debutante, uh, but she never really published anything. Um, and so really she was leaving, living a second empire life, but we see during the siege that she became more and more disillusioned with, uh, with France's provisional government and with sort of France's government in general, to the point where she starts making very political and sort of pro-communard, not explicitly pro-communard, but could be interpreted as pro-communard uh, comments at the end of the siege. Um, the way that she interacts with the commune itself is the way that a lot of, uh, you know, so-called apolitical, but also meaning conservative, uh, authors would, which is to condemn it, to say that we haven't we been through enough? Why is this happening now? Why are, why are Parisians revolting against this, you know, revolting now and causing more issues for the rest of us? Um, and so I think that, you know, the, the politics of folks during the, the siege, no one would, I don't think that may, very few authors would say that they were explicitly conservative or that they were Bonapartist or, you know, whatever, uh, because of the, the politics in the moment. But many of them would say, I'm just apolitical, I'm French. You know, I don't care what kind of government it is. I care about my country. I care about my fellow citizens, which is another way of saying that they're conservative, I think. This is another way of espousing a kind of status quo uh, a political stance. Um, and so, you know, there are folks that, you know, are explicitly Bonapartist or explicitly monarchist, but the, the vast majority of people uh, that, that I study um, just kind of express themselves to be, you know, I'm just, I'm trying to live my life, but their life was obviously a political life. These were political, you know, they were, they were smiled upon with the Second Empire. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, lots of questions coming in, Colin. Um, uh, and what from Miranda Sachs? Um, so uh, Miranda writes, uh, for those of us writing histories of broader swathes of time, it's often hard to deal with moments of crisis. For instance, um, uh, Miranda writes, I, I, I never know what to do with the flood of 1911. Mm -hmm. 
it seems that you're making a case for studying moments of crisis and using this moment to draw more general conclusions about the literature of crisis. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, I wonder, I mean, I, I do think that the, the siege is, I think as Nick, you once said, a fish, uh, like a, a fishbowl, right? It's sort of, it's self-enclosed. It's, in, you know, as I was saying, self-referential. And so this makes a really good case study for what happens, you know, when in, in a particular city without, you know, or in a particular community without kind of access to outside things. And so I don't, I, I don't want to say that everything is ex extractable to other moments of crisis, but I think generally thinking about how institutions, literary institutions, or any sort of institution, I guess, respond to these moments of crisis, this is a, a valid way for us to extrapolate uh, what happened during the siege to, to elsewhere. Um, and so I, you know, I, yeah, I mean, I hesitate to say that the the siege has extremely broad uh, applicability um, because it is so specific. But I think that the the lesson that comes from this is that it the, the specificities are important. Right? That dealing with the specific uh, kind of institutional cultures, institutional or excuse me, political cultures of a, of a certain period, reading them on their own terms rather than in the light of something else or um, something that happens in the future. That that's the the lesson I think that comes from. Uh, this particular moment. Mm. Thank you. Uh, we're uh, coming up to the uh, end of the hour, so as maybe this should be a, a, a final question. Um, uh, I wonder if you, we could pick up on that idea of specificity, and uh, if I could ask you whether, in the course of this project, you know, you've come across so many um, uh, new historical uh, uh, individuals. Um, is there anyone who has leapt out at you? Anyone who you've ended up being really fascinated by, uh, who, who, who kind of leaps out from the, the page of the historical record um, as being particularly significant, particularly interesting in this compressed moment of time? Yeah, I think uh, I've been thinking about this a lot, sort of like the afterlife of the siege. And I, you know, I mentioned this, sure. I mentioned this earlier too about how the member of the commune kind of gets uh, involved in this. Um, I think that one of the most interesting people that was relatively unknown before the siege, but then became famous afterwards is a poet named Emile Bergerat, uh, who some of you may know. Um, uh, it, if, if you don't, he's not super well known, but, um, but so during, the, you know, before the siege happened, he tried every once, he tried twice, I think, to get a play accepted at the Comédie Française, but each time he was rejected. Um, but during the siege itself, uh, when he heard about this battle that had happened um, outside of Paris, uh, the Battle of Reichshofen or Franchevé de Bar, um, he wrote this ode, au cuirassier de Reichshofen, so the, these, these heavy cavalry of Reichshofen, who in this myth, uh, you know, we don't know if this is really true, it probably isn't, uh, these heavy cavalry uh, sort of uh, uh, stopped the Prussian forces from attacking the French, allowing the French to retreat so this was another kind of like a Waterloo type moment where uh, the French, uh, even if they lost the battle, uh, they found nobility in defeat. Um, and so Bergerat, uh, the way he describes it in his memoirs, uh, heard about this, he read about it in the newspaper, he went home and he composed this ode, you know, sur le vif, in like an hour's time. And it became this super famous ode. It was finally read at the Comédie Française. So he got his wish during the siege itself to be on the stage of the Comédie Française. Uh, in his memoirs, he says, you know, uh, that this, this play, or excuse me, this poem, this ode, made him famous. He also claims uh, that Patrice de MacMahon, who later would become president of the, uh, of the Republic, uh, who was the general during this battle, or one of the commanders during this battle, I can't remember. He also claims that it's because of this ode that MacMahon became president. And he says, modestly, I may have made uh, Mac Mahon president. Um, so, I mean, all of this is completely fabricated. Of course, the, the, the ode itself was very popular during the siege, uh, but to claim that, you know, this made Mac Mahon president, I'm not really sure about. Um, but I think that, you know, this, this points to the, uh, the way that even in late 19th century France, that, that military valor still had a lot of, um, how should I call it? That military valor and sort of like uh, military escapades, let's say, um, were a basis for renown. Mm. Uh, being decorated, having served in the military, uh, having shown bravery during these moments uh, in this very kind of like masculine way, um, uh, this was still kind of a basis for uh, celebrity uh, later. And I think Bergerat's celebrity comes from, even if he was a Parnassian poet, you know, um, I think a lot of his celebrity comes from this, this anchoring in the uh, Franco-Prussian War and uh, 
the, the siege. Mm, that's, that's really interesting. It's a great um, place for us to um, to end. Um, and th that idea of honour and defeat, uh, and it'd be great to, to compare that with the whole um, story of uh, Bazet, uh, mm. uh, Les Sedan, and... Um, um, you know, Neuville's painting of Les Derniers Cartouches and the way in which that, that generates a, a whole field of um, uh, uh, cultural articulation around it. So um, yeah. that's really fascinating. Well, Colin, thank you so much. Uh, this has been really, really uh, genuinely interesting. And I've learned so much from your book. It's really changed the way that um, uh, I uh, come back to uh, my own um, uh, uh, texts uh, in and around 1870-71, La Debatte in particular. Uh, it's, uh, there, there are so many um, unanswered questions which I had, which you know your book has answered, so thank you. That's really great. Um, uh, and I think I should hand back to Susan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Nick. This is a terrific conversation. And I think everybody enjoyed it. There were so many questions in the chat. I think that there may be more discussion to follow here. Um, and so with that, I'll just invite everybody to turn cameras back on and chat a little bit more. And thank you again for being yeah, here. Thank today. you all so much for coming. And yeah, thank you, Nick, for a fascinating conversation. Appreciate it.